Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again, this time of a beloved classic from DC, The Great Darkness Saga of the Legion of Superheroes. We've talked a little bit about the Legion off and on, but let's get right into it here. The Legion of Superheroes is a really cool concept, and hey, any book that produces Arm Fall Off Boy is worthy of praise. It came about in the Silver Age mostly as a story to highlight Superboy. Remember that during the Silver Age, it was apparently popular to show Clark Kent as a teenager wearing the superhero suit in Smallville, and nobody made the connection later that the dude who used to run around in that outfit in Smallville might be the same guy who just moved to Metropolis wearing the exact same costume. In any case, the Legion are from the future, the 30th century, 31st for more modern stories. Teenagers with superpowers who banded together after being inspired by tales of superhero from the 20th century, Superboy in particular. Superboy became a member of the team and went on many adventures with them. They helped protect a federation of worlds called the United Planets, with regular police forces having now become the Science Police, a very misleading title considering they're all flat earthers. And they basically go around solving problems, being superheroes, interpersonal stuff, etc. Both Superboy and Supergirl would regularly interact with the Legion, which created the big problem with them that has plagued them for decades. Reboots. When Crisis on Infinite Earths rebooted the DC Universe, it created a new history for Superman and erased Supergirl entirely. In the case of Superman, he never was Superboy as a teenager, so a retcon had to be written in about the team's origins. There was almost a clone saga for them, as an intended storyline involving a group of six clones of Silver Age Legion members who would be found and revealed to be the real Legion, while the ones since then were the clones. That idea was stopped before it became canon. And then in 1994, in the wake of the event comic Zero Hour, it was decided to just reboot the Legion entirely. After all, unlike the rest of the DC Universe at the time, the Legion was completely disconnected from them. And then, ten years later, we got another reboot, referred to as the Three Boot Legion. Now, walking into this, I'm not really a big Legion follower. Nothing against the team, it's just a big group with a lot of history, and I was just not that interested. But I did read the Three Boot Legion, and I friggin' loved it. The Three Boot Legion was built around a futuristic teenage rebellion. Basically, society in a thousand years has become very closed off and a bit repressive. Not just standard government repression, but society itself thinks physical contact of any kind is weird and gross. People prefer to speak through technology, etc. The Legion instead acts as a force for social change while, of course, fighting crime and space threats and all. Eventually, all three Legions would gain validity in a miniseries, but the original version of them would be become the one that new stories were told even going into the New 52, bringing back the idea of a teenage Superboy hanging out with them because eventually all retcons circle back around on themselves. Today's review, The Great Darkness Saga, is considered one of, if not the best Legion stories ever told, so you can see why a patron would want me to cover it. So let's dig into The Legion of Superheroes, The Great Darkness Saga, and see if this thing is as good as it's said to be. Naturally, since we're both reading from a trade and reviewing multiple issues, we won't be looking at the cover. You may have also noticed I didn't bring up the trade for the comic. Well, I will eventually, but I'm not going to show it right now. 
Why? Because like any DVD for a movie that spoils a twist on its cover, the big reveal of the saga is right there for anyone not familiar with it to be not surprised when it happens. The trade also includes several issues before and after the saga, which consists of Legion of Superheroes number 290 through 294. For what reason, I'm not entirely sure, aside from one bit. From issue 287, a short story called Prologue to Darkness. Meet Shadow Lass and Monel. Shadow Lass has the ability to project darkness while also wearing a battle bikini. Monel is a Daxamite, an offshoot of Kryptonians who had long ago gone off their world and started their own civilization elsewhere. As such, once exposed to yellow sunlight, they indeed get powers comparable to Superman. The problem, though, is that instead of Kryptonite harming them, it's lead that's poisonous to them. Which basically means that we have an entire race of supermen whose only weakness is bullets. And indeed, I'm not entirely kidding there, since with kryptonite exposure, you take the kryptonite away and Superman would be fine. Daxamites, however, are permanently poisoned by exposure to lead, and it's fatal. In any event, the prologue story shows the two exploring an uncharted planet that wandered into major interstellar trade routes. The place is cold and long dead, the ruins of the former civilization there still having some automated defenses, but otherwise is abandoned. Save for a lone figure who wakes up one once they leave, swearing that soon the darkness will be coming. Issue 289 sees that dark figure creating five life forms to serve him. This new season of Power Rangers is weird. Anyway, we truly open on issue 290, where five members of the Legion, including Superboy, are investigating a fire at the Museum of the Mystic Arts, aka Doctor Strange's storage shed whenever he visits the DC Universe. The fire's been put out, but the Legion isn't certain who is responsible for this, especially since no one was attacked and nothing was stolen. Best we can figure, whoever it was wanted something he couldn't find. Hey, you know, sometimes things go crazy if you can't find the bathroom. I might not be so off with the Doctor Strange reference, since the curator of the museum comes out, and he does look kind of like the good doctor. Also, he's wearing that. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. The curator suspects that the attack was to steal an artifact he had removed for study. The Wand of Mentachem, with power over elements in their natural state. If the elements move to Michigan, then the wand is useless. The attacker returns, revealed to be this grayish-purple guy with pink energy billowing from his chest. Too much pink energy is dangerous. It grows darker throughout the universe, mortal, and there shall be no dawn. The power bill has not been paid. The Legion counterattacks, but the creature is formidable, easily swatting Superboy away and firing a blast of cold from its mouth at Cosmic Boy, who has magnetic powers, encasing him in ice. Freeze! Cool party! The creature is able to get away with the wand, escaping through a portal that goes ploink! Back at Legion headquarters, interpersonal stuff is happening. Shapeshifter Chameleon Boy recently caused an interstellar incident that could result in war with the Kuns, an aggressive power, and he's leaving to try to work things out with the United Planets government. One might think the interpersonal stuff is his teammates being supportive, but the thing is, this was entirely his fault, and he dragged along a few other Legion members, including Timberwolf here, who still pissed at him over the whole affair, since they almost got killed. But enough of that, back to the team who dealt with the creature. London, in 2982 AD, a neighborhood of Europolis, a subsidiary of Euro Disney. Yeah, Euro Disney bought out the original Disney in 2530. Nobody saw it coming. The curator had told them that other magical objects had been stolen recently. So I asked what object hadn't been stolen that he thought was a likely target, and he said, Excalibur! QED, our next stop, the Tower of London, where the only remaining copy of the movie Excalibur is. Well, normally you might think, well, Excalibur's just a legend. This is a comic book, after all. Every legend and myth and story and religion are all true. So indeed, Excalibur is also real in the DC Universe. What's more, according to the dialogue, Supergirl found it during one of her excursions with the Legion. Now, I have never read that tale, but I've gotta say, Supergirl better become the Queen of England in it. However, the team has arrived too late. An explosion in the tower knocks most of the Legion back. While Superboy, Cosmic Boy, and Phantom Girl deal with protecting tourists from falling debris, Wildfire and Invisible Kid head over to deal with the intruder. 
It's a different creature from before, this one stout and big-headed. Unfortunately, their enemy manages to get away with Excalibur, but Wildfire was able to punch it, so that's a plus. Back at Legion HQ, more interpersonal stuff. Lightning Lad is having weird electrical problems in his brain. Saturn Girl and Timberwolf are being uncomfortable because their respective significant others are being awkward towards them because of a somewhat intimate moment the two had when they thought they were going to die. You know, 1980s teen superhero drama stuff. What? It was a thing. The X-Men, New Teen Titans, Legion, everybody did that stuff in the 80s. 80s superhero comics were basically soap operas with more punching and slightly less demonic possessions and aliens. We cut to the dead world, where the big-headed creature returns with Excalibur and... <laughs> okay, um, their leader is, uh... A little more visible now, but I've got to wonder if there was a coloring error given what I know about this guy because, uh, spoilers, he doesn't look like this later. But with the shoulder pads and armored girdle and purple leggings and stuff. Ha 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 ha! Your costume is ridiculous! You have done well, my little mockeries. Misshapen as you are, you shall yet prove perfect servants. And in that lies the greatest irony of all. In fact, in celebration of this, we shall now listen to Alanis Morissette's Ironic. You do not comprehend, and that too is how I wish it to be. You see, it is ironic because a wedding is supposed to be a happy occasion, while rain is symbolic of melancholy and sadness, so having rain on your wedding day... After absorbing energy from Excalibur, we cut back to the Tower of London. The group decides they need to head back to Legion HQ and get reinforcements. Even Invisible Kid, who just joined the team, is chomping at the bit to go after the creatures. Are you sure? That's a a rough first solo mission. Can anyone else disappear and follow invisibly? You're gonna make a heck of a legionnaire, friend. If you live long enough. Superboy! Implying his teammate will die soon. After coordinating with Brainiac 5, the good guy descendant of the classically villainous Brainiac, they determine that it's likely the next theft will be on Shadowlass's homeworld, Talok 8. And indeed, it seems Earth wasn't the only one hit by the thefts. Talok also had a bunch of museum pieces stolen. Man, the sequel to Hudson Hawk is even crazier than I thought it would be. Another of the creatures, a woman with a ton of hair, arrives, and Superboy and Wildfire are able to fend it off, but then another one shows up to back it up, this one riding some kind of hover scooter while pink smoke billows from its forehead. Oh no, pink smoke! Now we know this is serious! Their master opens a portal for Hover Scooter Guy to return, but it closes before the woman can travel through it, allowing our heroes to take her prisoner. Back at Legion HQ, they've decided to schedule their election for a new leader, long story there, and the current acting leader, Element Lad, puts his name in for the running. However, Dream Girl also decides to run. I'm in the running too. And I mean, well, look at me. Just... What the hell is she doing? She puts her leg up on the table as if she was going to start doing some calisthenics. Ultra Boy also decides to run, although without showing off his thighs. The others return with their prisoner, but that gets interrupted. The United Planets' liaison to the Legion contacts them to inform them that Chameleon Boy is scheduled to stand trial on grounds of treason the next day. As Superboy and Shadowlass take their prisoner to a medical chamber for examination, both realize that there's something oddly familiar about both her and the one with a chest symbol from before. Issue 290 ends with the creature's master absorbing the power of the latest artifact. Ah, I am fulfilled. At least for now. My time has come, my little mockery. Do you not feel it? The destiny which has escaped me for so long is to be met. Darkness shall cover the universe and reduce all within to my slaves. And you, my son, shall ever be first among them. Nothing makes a kid happier than learning they get to be chief slave. Their lord heads off to start absorbing energy elsewhere, leading us into issue 291. Monel examines the prisoner and discovers why she's so familiar to Shadowlass. Her DNA matches one of her ancestors, Lydia Mallor. Lydia was a member of an intergalactic police force back in the regular time of the DC Universe called Legion. While apparently these were the ancestors of the Legion of Superheroes, in truth, Legion has always been a part of DC cosmic stuff and tended to do its own thing, having a series that lasted for several years before being relegated to bit parts and other DC space stuff. 
But yeah, this creature they've captured is not her. Some kind of clone made of inanimate matter. While they mull over this bit, we cut to the planet Avalon, where the Master's servant breaks out Mordru, longtime enemy of both the regular DC Universe, but also in particular the Legion. However, the Master is here only to absorb Mordru's power for his own, showing how even this foe is more powerful than him. Back on Earth, Chameleon Boy's attorney tells him that he's basically screwed. The government is out for blood since the Kuns are using this as an excuse to rally for war. Back with the Legion, I told you, Ultra Boy, I'm not postponing the election. Chameleon Boy's problems are his own. R.J. Brand has hired the best lawyers for his trial before the United Planets Council. Considering the best lawyers are telling him, yeah, we can't do anything, you're boned. I hope he can get a refund. Chameleon Boy also told them not to come to his trial, so yeah, they're gonna continue the election. Dream Girl has a prophetic vision, that's her power, but she doesn't react well to it. All hell starts breaking loose. A major disturbance on the planet Tacron Galtos, a prison world, a report about Mordru being freed on Avalon, and Dream Girl's vision was of her sister being attacked by one of the creatures. We'll refer to them as the Servants of Darkness, since the comic does too. First up, we see the team dealing with the prison, with Ultra Boy and mon -El in particular managing to round up most of the prisoners fairly quickly by creating some quick walls around them. Good thinking, pal. Remember that at election time, Mon. I think Element Lad preset all monitor systems to tape all three missions. And I trust this one will remind everyone of what I can do. I'm sure that'll be a great comfort to the families of all the prison guards who were killed while you were worrying about showboating, man. Just saying, this is not gonna look good during the primaries. Anyway, at the center of it all is, of course, the Darkness Guy, and the Servant, who's surfing on what looks like two sets of bike handlebars fused together. The Legion manages to drive them off before any more damage is done, but their target, another longtime Legion villain called the Time Trapper, was partially drained and is babbling about the darkness. At Avalon, they find Mordru, just as drained and whimpering about the darkness. And finally on Naltor, they meet with Dream Girl's sister. I'm sorry for having kept you waiting, Legionnaires. I am Mysa, Nura's sister, the White Witch. And if you don't want to serve that Dark Master guy, just saying, instead of a Dark Lord, you could have a Queen! Big-headed Servant arrives and attacks, but fortunately the Legion, armed with Light Lass and Sunboy, are able to repel him back through a portal. Invisible Kid runs through to try to follow him back, but is intercepted by their master, who can see him fine. He blasts Invisible Kid with eye beams, and he runs back out the portal, just as horrified by the darkness as the villains. No time to deal with that, though, because Dream Girl gets another prophetic vision, this time of the heroes fighting the servants on a planet called the Sorcerer's World, and losing. Back at Legion HQ, the woman servant wakes up and almost manages to escape, but Saturn Girl's telepathic calls wake up Lightning Lad and get him to save them. In the wake of that, and to end the issue, Dream Girl is elected the new Legion leader. Unfortunately, Ultra Boy did not look good on camera, and that ended up hurting him in the polls. Issue 292 begins with the Legion heading off the prison planet to meet with the other two groups, but also seeing Chameleon Boy being shipped to said prison planet, having been convicted of treason. Warning, do not remove antenna bindings. They are required to neutralize Convict's Durlin shape-changing ability. We're also using it to get local channels, and we're watching NBC right now. The Sorcerer's World is the home of many of the greatest mystics in the galaxy, and we see a demonstration of some of their abilities. Giant creatures appearing and disappearing. Cities built on the backs of frozen waves. Admittedly an illusion, but still pretty impressive. Their ship gets blasted by the Dark Servants, four of which come to deal with the Legion. mon -El freezes one of them and flies into their portal to take on their master, but as soon as he spots him, he recognizes him. Oh my god! Y your your power! I am power, darkness, and all you should fear, stripling. Elon Musk, what are you doing here? The master is able to read his mind somehow. I'm not sure, given his identity. Maybe this was a power he had all along, but whatever. And discovers the existence of Daxum. Back at Legion HQ, Lightning Lad, Saturn Girl, and Cosmic Boy have their computers analyze DNA from the other servants they've encountered. The big-headed one seems to be a clone of one of the Guardians of the Universe. If you don't remember, they're the blue guys who created the Green Lantern Corps. 
and are uber powerful. The one with the symbol on his chest? A clone of Superman. Ugh, I think they might have gotten his hair a bit wrong. The Legion recruits the leading sorcerers of the planet to come to their aid, but they may be too late. The portal that's remaining open is busy absorbing mystic energy directly from the planet. Wildfire goes out to engage the servants directly, and gets blasted apart as a result. So that's a bit of a whoopsie. In the meantime, the sorcerers concoct a spell to create something they can use to fight the darkness. And a portal opens up, dropping out a baby. They're not sure what it means, but Dream Girl can definitely sense with some light precognition that the baby is exactly what they need. At Legion headquarters, the three decide enough's enough. If the servants and their master are this powerful, they need all the help they can get. As such, they send out a general alarm to all Legionnaires and reserves, who answer the call. Back to battle, now that we know the identities of the Guardian and Superman servants, I do find it kind of hilarious that the master made sure to dress up the Superman clone in a cape and chest logo. I mean, that's just good branding. How else am I gonna sell this darkness thing if I don't have a Superman knockoff? The remaining Legionnaires retreat to the island housing the sorcerers, but the Master stops his servants from following. He even gives back the injured heroes, saying he's gonna be merciful, though he does keep Wildfire's head as a trophy. As for you, young ones, you may live to witness my triumph in recognition of the service done me by one of your number. Also, here's a 50% off coupon for a bootleg Superman. Oh jeez, I know who the master is. He's that guy who got transformed into a son from the Hellraiser Dark Holiday special. Despite the Master leaving, the Legionnaires think they've failed. Fortunately, Dream Girl declares that by keeping them from touching the island, they've ensured their victory. Also, Wildfire's not dead. He's pure energy, so they just needed to whip up a new containment suit for him. mon -El, though, is in a coma and in no position to tell them the Master's identity. Issue 292 ends with the Sorcerers realizing their victory was costly, still losing mystic energy from the planet itself, and two of their number died to make sure the baby was delivered to them. Issue 293 begins with the Legion reuniting in full and deciding to take the fight to the Servants of Darkness. They head out to different worlds searching for them, one group heading to that dead world from before, thinking it may have something to do with the Master, and they're ambushed by the servants. According to Lightning Lad, that strange servant I fought was actually some kind of mirror image clone of me. Who in Krypton's name could do that? There's no one in my time with that kind of power. Not even Luthor! I mean, Luthor would have to combine his DNA with mine to do that, and that would mean he'd be evil or something! Why, a Superboy that was evil? <laughs> yeah, maybe if he was wearing a leather jacket or something. Over to Chameleon Boy, he's being visited by his father, a rich Durlin stuck in human form who'd been bankrolling the Legion for years. According to him, he didn't even know about what happened until the trial was over. So either he's full of it, or Element Lad saying he hired the best lawyers was full of it. Bet it was Element Lad. He did seem a bit eager to try to get to the election. This might just hurt his chances for running again. The Master heads to Daxum and walks right out onto it. Ah, yes. So this is the world of Daxum. A pity it has taken me so long to learn of its existence. But knowledge, once possessed, is the most sure source of power. Support your local libraries, kids, and you could be an evil overlord just like me! While studying the baby they got from the Sorcerer's Planet, they realize that he's begun to rapidly age. Oh god, no! Dream Girl, if that thing claims to be your lover from another dimension, have Wildfire kill it immediately! On Daxum, the Master uses his own willpower, a pretty strong one at that, to take over the minds of the three billion Daxamites on the planet. He then creates a massive portal to trade Daxum with the dead world, shifting it from its regular solar system with a red sun, and into one with a yellow sun, basically granting the Master of Darkness a standing army of three billion people with Superman-level abilities. Few times has it been more appropriate to say, pants to be darkened. Some of the Legion members reunite over the dead world and engage the servants, having somewhat better luck this time in the fight. 
Back on Daxum, we discover that things are even worse. Take a look. He's taking control of Spider-Man, the Mighty Thor, Aang from Avatar, and Her Holiness the Pope, armed with her divine pasties. He uses the Daxamites to reshape the planet, destroying their civilization and cities to transform it into a representation of his head. We'll get back to that in a second. On the Dead World, now knowing that the One Servant was made from Superman's DNA, Element Lad transforms some of the rocks surrounding him into gold kryptonite, the kind that can permanently strip a Kryptonian of their powers. As such, Timberwolf is then able to I am a man punch the servant into several pieces. The remaining servants run like hell upon seeing that. The group wants to celebrate their first real victory against them, but Brainiac 5 realizes just how boned they are. Aside from the fact that the Master now has Daxum, since their planets have switched locations, upon seeing this world, he now knows who their enemy is. And as the Daxamites finish their work reshaping their planet, the Master sends them all off into the universe to begin his conquest, and reveals his identity. Dark side. It's one of those ingenious ideas in comics that you're always shocked that no one did it before then. After all, the new gods are a part of DC's cosmic stuff too, so why wouldn't they still be around in the 30th century? Oh, and yeah, good job ruining the reveal on the cover, DC! What, you couldn't just make it a silhouette or something? Okay, as we move into number 294, the conclusion of the saga, I do have to comment on the cover to it, where apparently the way to defeat Darkseid is to kneel down and start doing the YMCA poses. Brainiac 5 explains that all the clues point to Darkseid, in particular that the planet they're on is what remains of Apocalypse. mon -El recognized him because he was in the Phantom Zone for a good chunk of time, able to observe the outside world, and indeed saw Superman's battles with him, and with the knowledge of just what what the threat they're up against, someone with the power of a god, they extend their call for legionnaires to not just the reserve members, but basically everybody they know. The Legion of Substitute Heroes, the Wanderers, Supergirl, etc. Meanwhile, the Daxamites are rampaging across the universe, devastating populated worlds, smashing up barren, uninhabited ones just because they're in the way. Man, even in the future, GPSs give bad directions. Most do not speak as they trample lives and destroy riches, and those that do simply mutter a single word over and over and over under their breath. Flum Flufelnorp. It doesn't really have an English translation. The only advantage the various other heroes out there have against someone with the power of Superboy is that the Daxamites are pretty much mindless. There's no strategy or intellect to how they're fighting. However, when you have three billion superpowered beings flying at you, strategy only does so much. You know, Black, when I joined the Legion, it was much simpler. We caught a crook here, stopped a war there. Yes, nothing simpler in the life of a superhero than stopping wars. The baby has started growing again, now a small child, and unusually still hasn't uttered a peep. Not even a cry of any kind. Before they can question that much more, a horde of Daxamites attack their ship and cut its power. A portal opening up, and one of the servants of darkness emerging, and demanding the child be handed over to save their lives. Sunboy's response is to shoot him. Then you shall have no hope of survival, mortal. This is my master's hour. The dawn of the great darkness that will cover the universe for an eternity. And yes, I realize I'm confusing my metaphors a bit, considering I'm talking about the dawn of darkness, and that it's especially odd saying that to a guy named Sun Boy, but... but I... Shut up! Your face is the dawn! The Daxamites tear the ship apart, allowing the servant to grab the child while Negative Zone Deadpool there floats away. On Tacron Galtos, it too is being attacked, though only by a single Daxamite child. It's chasing after Chameleon Boy, who manages to evade it long enough to get the child tossed into the cell of a villain named Validus, who's strong enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone that powerful. Which should be a great comfort if this kid somehow loses his powers and is then murdered by the giant supervillain. Yeah, I know, it's still a good solution for the short term. Just saying, this could get really tragic really quick. The Legionnaires in the destroyed ship are rescued by the others, and they use the White Witch's magics to try to replicate the space warp Darkseid has been using to transport his servants. What's not really clear is if those warps are meant to be boom tubes, the portals new gods usually use to travel, since they don't have the telltale, well, 
boom that signifies their activation, at least until now. Darkseid even identifies this one as a boom tube as he orders his servant to murder the child since they no longer have time to study him. As the Legion begins fighting Daxamites who are guarding Darkseid, Lightlass and Shadowlass reach the child, who is mentally contacting the White Witch. It seems the child is now ready to fulfill its purpose in opposing Darkseid but it needs some more magical help from her. I am sorry to use you this way, my child, but the pain shall be over quickly. Use her? Oh God, it is Marcus from Avengers number 200. Run for it, White Witch! The White Witch's spell swaps all the Daxamites in the area back to Apocalypse, ridding them of their powers. Darkseid, however, is a sore loser and uses his own power to... I don't know, mentally project an illusion of each Legion member's worst fears? This part is a little iffy to me. Same for him controlling all the Daxamites. I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but I don't really think of Darkseid as someone with telepathic abilities. It's certainly possible he just developed them over the last thousand years, but his entire goal was to find the anti-life equation, which allows someone to take control of people's minds. So is that what this is? Or did he just figure out the telepathy thing worked for that? In any case, he and the servant traveled to the kid, with Darkseid apparently diving through like he was expecting to land in a pool on the other end. Darkseid demands that Shadowlass turn the kid over to him, but she encases him in a bubble of shadows. Earlier, her shadows had repelled one of Darkseid's machines, so she thinks it might work against him too. And if not, what'll you do? You can't kill me more than once anyway! Well, there's an unorthodox taunt. Ha! You might kill me, but you can only do it once! Check and mate! He sends in his Servant of Darkness to get the child, but then there's a ticking sound from within the shadows. Oh crap, the kid was a bomb the whole time! No, Darkseid says it's a mother box, which I thought went ping, but whatever. And out of the shadows emerges... High Father and Orion. Yep, the child was a reborn High Father, Darkseid's opposite number on New Genesis, and the Servant of Shadows was a clone of Darkseid's son. High Father has restored him to his natural form, I guess giving him some clothes while he was at it. I was that child, Darkseid, reborn with the innocence of new life, as you should have been reborn. But unlike you, I know my time is past, and I can only exist in this time momentarily. Yet there is much I must do. First things first, I'm changing out my diaper. Orion goes on the attack. There's a prophecy that says the final battle against Darkseid would be fought in a fire pit between him and Orion. Darkseid feared this for centuries. And whether it will happen now, or whether this is but a shadow of the ultimate struggle, only the next few moments shall decide. Or rather the page flip as Darkseid succeeds in destroying the clone since he's not the original. Perhaps the prophecy has already come true, and that is why I slept. I have forgotten so much. For example, why do I feel this compulsion to go to a slumberland furniture and buy a comfy couch? High Father is nowhere to be seen, so Darkseid figures even he couldn't sustain himself for very long and that he's won. And then he gets double punched in the face by Superboy and Supergirl, High Father's last gift to them being the temporary ability to shrug off the red sun radiation. Man, imagine sleeping for a thousand years after Superman kicked your ass so many times, only to wake up to find a younger one with more stamina and his cousin around waiting to kick your ass again. Darkseid is having a bad day. Darkseid uses his Omega Beams to transport Superboy back to his own time. Okay, but what's stopping the Legion from just picking him up out of his time and bringing him back again? Supergirl friggin' picks up Darkseid and drives him into the ground again, bouncing him off of it like a basketball. He tries to use his powers to blast her, but she just friggin' flies through it and punches him so hard that it sends him off the planet. Darkseid, do your worst! It's not enough! When you get to hell, tell the Anti-Monitor I said hi! Unfortunately, Darkseid still has his boom tubes, which 
yeah, again, considerably quieter in the 30th century, since Darkseid is able to use it to teleport behind Supergirl and inflict pain on her. But fortunately, the rest of the Legion finally arrives, including Sailor Mercury, apparently. Darkseid, despite being in tatters, still thinks he's winning, but Saturn Girl tells him how screwed he is. Can't you feel it, Darkseid? Can't you feel yourself losing? All your power, and you can't even defeat us. This is no longer the universe you knew, Mon monster, and it is beyond your power. Well look, I just woke up from my nap, give me a chance to have my coffee and then we'll talk. Darkseid senses a truth in what she's saying, and realizes his powers have waned considerably over the last thousand years. The attacks by Highfather, Orion, Superboy, Supergirl, and now the Legion have distracted him, and he lost control over all the Daxamites. And now three billion pissed off people with Superman level powers are coming right for him. It seems there is more to you than I dreamed, youths. You have done that which is beyond imagining. You have shattered the dream of a god. I just wanted to take over the universe and consume it with darkness. Why'd you have to be so mean? You have won, children of the light. The darkness is fading, even as we watch. But remember, the darkness cannot surrender. It is always with you, always on the fringe of the dawn. And the instant you gaze at it in fear, your time will come. So, what you're saying is, don't have a staring contest with darkness, gotcha. Darkseid teleports away, but not without leaving behind a warning that he's cursed the Legionnaires and that the darkness will destroy them from within, starting with the purest of them. But hey, they did win. In the first epilogue, Lightlast tells Timberwolf that in the wake of all the recent events, she wants to leave the Legion and that he has to come with her if he wants to stay with her. And so our comic ends with the second epilogue, Supergirl saying goodbye to Brainiac 5 and admitting he's cute. 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 She did say cute. She believes that I am cute! The Great Darkness Saga is, of course, pretty damn good. I'd say my only problems with it are minor continuity gaffes relating to Darkseid's powers, tech, or that weird outfit he was apparently wearing before. The build-up is handled well, and all the hinting about Darkseid being the master is really good and nicely vague, so it's not obvious from the get-go. And with Darkseid having slumbered for so long, it leaves details about how he and Apocalypse got to their current state ambiguous so as not to tie old stories down to any specific continuity thread, other than knowing that new Genesis is equally gone in the future. If I did have one critique, it'd be the Chameleon Boy stuff. Not that it was bad, but considering how big a deal Treason is, and the emotional fallout with his teammates over the whole affair, maybe it would have been better to postpone it a bit until after the Great Darkness Saga was over. We don't even see his trial, any defense of his actions, or stuff like that, and he's mostly ignored because of the more important stuff involving Darkseid's invasion. One might also think the conclusion to the saga is a bit underwhelming, given how most of the Legion don't actually fight Darkseid, but what brawls we do get against him and his servants are still great, and in the end, it was still the Legion who told him to take a hike and he knew when he was defeated. It's good stuff, and for any newcomers to comics, it explains most of the backstory you would need within the pages, despite the large cast. Next time, the Patreon viewer's choice has been decided. We're starting off the 10th anniversary celebration properly with a return to James Bond Jr. It will be considerably less epic than this week was.
but let the universe howl in despair, for I have returned.